Hi everybody and welcome to this new episode of Afterthoughts. My name is Wim Winters and tonight I have, I have to say, we have recorded the a beautiful piece by Clementi and I really hope you enjoyed the performance of my youngest daughter, Evelyn. Evelyn, like we say, she uh, really wanted to be on the movie with her daddy and so with the help of her sister we managed to have this page turn for this very beautiful edition of Clementi. Um, I don't know where I bought it, but I have this for a long time, I think more than 20 years. So, the Gratis Ad Parnassum by Clementi, and this is his, I think this is the second volume, and I have two copies of this, both the same to the second volume. And, you know, we did a few weeks or months ago some pieces by Clementi, Preludes and Fugues, and we definitely will do more of that because that's very beautiful music. And I've done some Clementi sonatas, which are also not so much known um, in general to the general public, so to say. But I think even in print, they have been they are working now in Italy on a complete. Maybe it's finished the project on a complete edition of all Clementi works and his letters. I actually have the uh, edition of his letters, very beautiful. It's quite expensive, but it's about time that for this genius, really a good edition was to be made. This Gratus at Parnassum is a collection of pieces that he brought together from old works. And if I am right, it's about 1817. It's Opus 44. So it is a little bit earlier, earlier I think, than Czerny's uh, Gratus at Parnassum. Uh, but anyway, what Clement is doing is implementing uh, older work. So the fugue that we've played, this one, I've played. And so on. That's a work where he writes in the introduction that this was published actually already in 1780 in Paris. And from the life of Clementi, he was traveling through Europe at the time, at that time. And one year later, with Christmas Eve, I ever made a a, a small document, not a documentary, it's just a fantasy story about that. So at Christmas Eve 1881, he was about to uh, meet Mozart in that famous so-called uh, competition. But anyway, so 1780, Clementi was traveling throughout Europe as a virtual. So he was born in Italy. He was, um, he got the attention of an Englishman who asked fa Clementi's father if he could just take his son to England to give him an, an education as a musician. And that was, that happened. I think he was seven or eight years old. I went to London, I presumably I think, and he played a lot of mostly music of Bach, Handel and, and uh, CPE Bach, so Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. So that explains in a bit, a bit that he was very familiar with this Baroque um, style of polyphony. And what Clementi actually did in that time, and I pointed that out a little bit in that, that small um, documentary that I made, is he he set a benchmark on all fields, musical fields, on, and certainly also on technical field. I mean, what he was doing, 1780, 1781, 1782, the, the publication of his first sonatas, and I will link some of them up in the description box. We have made some recordings of that. It's really astonishing. Um, Mozart, as I pointed out in that documentary, but it's such a fantasy story, but I think that Mozart uh, really didn't know what he saw when he saw Clementi playing, and he changed the style, he, he, he really developed his, his, his technical skills to what Clementi was offering the public, and, and Mozart, of course, being a genius, um, reached the same level within no, no time. Um, but Clementi was, in, in, kind, in, in a certain way, renewing in, in a way that, that few other people have been in history. Bach, of course, we've talked about the partitas, how refreshing that was, how renewing that was, and that's, that's really, 
out of reach of, of so many other uh, composers and players, but um, Beethoven also with his first sonatas, that is as if there is 30 years of history just uh, being taken out of real time. I mean, first sonatas of Beethoven is, is incompre incomprehensible new music. Of course, you can see clear where it comes from, but he, what he's doing with that. Clementi, in his own way, he paved, so to say, the way for both Mozart, but certainly Beethoven also. So we've talked about that in the past. At the same time, he goes back and starts a writes fugues, and maybe he did that already from childhood on, that was kind of exercise, maybe. And this Gradus at Parnassum actually is a combination exactly the same as Czerny does, a combination of exercise, exercises, and which are clearly meant for the piano. Uh, more than five octaves is he using. There are some exercises that really can be played on the clavichord as well, so on a five octave instrument in general. And then he combines that with fugues, and sometimes the fugues are um, have a little introduction. So the fugue I now played for you is written so in 1780. He says that he has enlarged the piece a little bit, and um, so it's, it's written for five octaves. Maybe compared to Czerny, a little bit older style, but imagine this is 1780, the Czerny fugues I think were newly written around 1815, 1820, I don't know exactly the date. So, going through that piece, this is, uh, first of all, like with Journey, also the music of Clementi, it is a joy to play. It really fits the keyboard so well. And uh, answering the question that is inevitably with this music, is this written for clavichord? I don't think so. So, if, and not in, while he published this in 1817, people were not looking back, people were looking forward. And if he wrote, wrote a fugue, that was actually a kind of study really for obtaining, for mastering the technique, more than saying that the style of G.S. Bach and his contemporaries is better than what they did. So 1817, I think that's the time where the clavichord, certainly for, Clem for Clementi, was, was over a period, of, also for Beethoven. But in 1780, traveling to Europe and of course in Paris, France had little, much, little to do with clavichord. Um, there is actually not so much, to my knowledge, being published and research about that. At least I haven't found, found that, so we don't know. There is a letter of Mozart, um, of Mozart's father to Mozart, that when Mozart was in Paris, that he writes, please uh, find you a clavichord. It's not easy to find one there, but be sure you have a clavichord with that, otherwise only playing the harpsichord will spoil your touch. I'm sorry, but for the harpsichordists, no, it's a joke. But that's what Mozart uh, wrote, and I think we all know what he meant by that. So um, France had little to do with, with clavichord, maybe, but of course he traveled to Vienna and maybe even to Germany. I don't know. That's something I don't know. But what kind of instrument did he have in mind? The early piano pianos uh, in square pianos, probably also. But here and there, this clavichord, like you see here, was really at the height of its position in 1780. Uh, people think that clavichord and harpsichord building was from before 1750, but that's actually not true. Around 1780, um, as I have been told, this is a, a top production, both of harpsichord and, and clavichord, certainly of clavichords. So he must have had clavichords at his disposal. And anyway, this music fits very well on this kind of keyboards. I can say that if the music is written really for another instrument in mind, like later Beethoven sonatas, then it's impossible to play on clavichord. So you could turn the things around. In order to make it playable on a clavichord, you better keep in the back of your head the difficulties that this instrument have has. And so for me, when the piece is playable on clavichord without doing too much effort, then I think it's 
it's very well possible and legitimate, so to say, to play the piece on clavichord uh, without having a Clementi when you would enter this room being very surprised. Um, okay, so there's actually not so much to say about this piece that it's just a beautiful full voiced field. With much care of the of the of the of the voices leading, maybe better or different than Journey. Journey's fugues remind me also to Mendelssohn, so they are a little bit more um, adapted to the style. This is the keys are going well, not further than Bach, because Bach is really the Caesar Franco of the 18th century. But the, uh, the he's, he's exploring all kind of keys, maybe a little bit more freedom than a Baroque you would expect. But for the rest, the the, the the lines and the melodic lines are very fine. Trip uh, thirds because he was very very known for that. It's impossible to play on a clavichord and on an early piano either to play this legato on the typically on the modern grand piano you would slightly touch the right pedal the sustaining pedal and all the thirds would sound not too overwhelmed by the sustaining pedal but just enough that they sound legato but it's impossible here and i don't think they back then had the intention to play all the thirds legato because the fingering doesn't fit you've changed here Anyway, when you detach the note a little bit, you should try to make it beautiful so that it uh, connects with a kind of accentuation pattern. And a beautiful entrance in the bass. And you see that's exactly as you see with Mozart and Beethoven that and certainly with Beethoven that Beethoven is exploring the instrument and it's really uh, looking at it from a very instrumental angle I mean he gives the room to some part and Clemente does that as a genius it, look what the right hand is going up and he gives all the space and all the room to the left hand and to to, to make a beautiful fortissimo bass Again, uh, I lengthen the notes to make in the right hand. Actually, it was written. Of course, that's not what Clementi meant. Also, the left hand. I, I should not use substitutions. Substitutions, is that correct English? I mean, so holding the same note and replacing with another finger. I wouldn't do it too much. It doesn't work on clavichord, it's very, very good, um, but it doesn't help you because it's against the flow of the music. Just release. So it's not perfectly legato, but this is a suggestion of legato, it's enough. And let the other voices help that. Beautiful entrance again, and here. The entrance on the bass also here is so nice. Beautiful modulation. It's really a nice tension, nice atmosphere. sharp major so it's really going somewhere here again pianissimo crescendo forte entrance beautiful here 
the line, the, the B flat on the bass that is still there. That it's kind of commotion here, and then there's the B flat as a kind of senior voice, you know. And here also the scale. From bottom to top. Beautiful. The, the, G, the G flat is so nice and minor. Nothing happening here, it's just going somewhere. And then climax. Again, it's not coming there, it's still waiting. And still continu continuing, pianissimo. With the with the, the the repetition of the note, it kind of entrance, of course, but it's not. It takes your attention. Building up, and there it's a come. And here the F and the A. Also in the voice, the L, the tenor. Oh, da, 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 da. And then that's the climax. A kind of strato. Closing statements is going down, down. Difficult to talk. It reminds me on the last part of the Bach Fantasia. And the last movement, you have also these chromatic lines going down. It's not that dramatic, of course, here, but it's a kind of same atmosphere. How it, how it starts here and it's coming down slowly. It's like climbing a very huge mountain of tower and you're just descending. You have had the view and now you're going down just back to earth. Entrance, not an entrance, but a, a kind of um, emphasizing the closement statement. Always going down. Last point of energy. And now it's really closing. In fact, I think that's a really nice fugue. And he has others as well. So there's a nice adagio here. We're going to do it. So that's it works very well on clavichord. That's that's really piano music that, but it goes on clavichord fine. And I don't have a clavichord yet. It's coming. But, um, I actually have a small movie made at your uh, workshop, but I haven't got the time to share it with you. But I will really. A lot of things have are about to change in the YouTube channel, and we're going to add some other things. So. To close, Clementi, um, I hope you really like that I, as much as I did. And if you didn't know the music, I, I'm really glad that I could have could share that with you because it's really worth looking forward. It's easy to find the score on, on the Petrucci library and elsewhere. So don't hesitate to play it. I think it will be beautiful also on a modern piano if you happen not to have an early keyboard at home. So that was it for today. 
hope you enjoyed it leave your comments below i will make a new series of vlogs and that will call, be called your time because you leave so such nice comments on youtube facebook and sometimes also through personal mail that it's a pity not to share that with a lot of more people and sometimes you ask me for a reaction or, or an idea on that and then i can bundle that in a new series so that's all coming up it's a lot of work exciting work um, and we want to do it okay and we want to do it good so please be a little bit patient everything will come on its time like this view of clementi so thank you for watching listening subscribing to the channel, sharing this video with all your friends and we see each other very soon again. Bye.